I want to thank you all for coming today. Um, I'm very honored to have been selected um, to represent the Duke Transplant Programs today and um, really want to share an inspirational and emotional story with you. Um, definitely a, a story of courage in the face of adversity, uh, generosity in a time of grief, and surgical innovation and expertise. Um, I'd like to start first with uh, explaining a little bit about um, courage. Uh, Mr. Nada, who's the recipient of the intestine and abdominal wall transplant that we're here to um, discuss, started his journey with us about four years ago. And I won't tell his whole story. I'll let him share what he would like. But when he came to us, he um, was desperately ill. His doctors at the outside hospital before referring him had discussed um, hospice with him. And uh, one of them had heard about uh, Duke's innovative surgical programs and, and suggested that maybe we could try to help uh, save his life. And thankfully, they contacted us. And we worked with him over many months to um, uh, perform many surgeries uh, that eventually led to some stabilization. And, and uh, he was able to. Um, receive his nutrition through an IV catheter, um, although we were not able to restore his ability to eat. Um, at that time, we began to talk about what his long-term options might be, and we felt that intestinal transplant may be the, rest, the best way to go. And in fact, um, went ahead and went through an evaluation for intestinal transplant. But we also knew that the amount of scarring he had had at the time was too much for us to be able to provide coverage for the intestine. And so we talked with Dr. Erdman, who I had worked with on a number of other um, complex patients, to try to figure out what options we might have um, if we did proceed with intestinal transplant. And at that time, Dr. Sandalis was here um, and had performed the uh, first hand transplant. And, um, developed the vascularized composite, composite tissue allograft program. And so we began to talk about whether abdominal wall transplant could be an option. Um, Dr. Erdman actually had started down this path about 15 years ago um, when Scott Levin was here. And, and he and Dr. Levin had begun to think about abdominal wall transplantation and begun the preparation um, with Dr. Ravindra's help, uh, Detlev and, and um, and Ravindra um, really did a lot of work in preparation, and I'll let them speak to some of the work that they did. Um, but without them, this would not have been possible. So definitely wanted to thank them. Um, I also want to thank Dr. Ravindra, as well as my other surgical colleagues specifically, for all of the help that they um, gave in caring for Mr. Nada. Also, um, one to mention Dr. Segovia, Julie Kyer, uh, Julie Hudson. Um, and I want to tell you a short story of the night that we actually called uh, Mr. Nada in for transplant. <clears throat> Obviously, it takes a multitude of people to, to care for patients um, through organ donation and transplantation. But Michelle Hendricks was our transplant coordinator that was on that night. And, some of you may recall back in the middle of October, we had some pretty bad um, storms. And the power was out, and Michelle was on call. Couldn't get onto her laptop to uh, perform the, uh, the needed um, work to, to call in the patient. <coughs> Pardon me. So she actually went in search of electricity um, to a local establishment. I believe she said it was Doherty's and Carrie. And they provided her a table and an electrical connection to allow her to um, do the things that she needed to do in order to call in Mr. Nada. So definitely an, an interesting evening. Um, I also want to thank our anesthesia colleagues, um, <clears throat> our OR staff, um, Beth Hollister, who was instrumental in, in helping us in setting up the clinical research side. And I, I'd like to... Uh, thank all of you for being here to celebrate this event. <coughs> Pardon me. Most of all, I think it's remarkable that um, our donor family has been here to share this with us today. If it weren't for their generosity in the time of grief, uh, none of this would be possible. So thank you very much. <coughs> mm -hmm. 
You good? Okay. Good morning. Um, thank you for joining us. My name is Detlef Erdmann, German name. Um, I'm a professor of plastic surgery here at Duke University. And um, as Dr. Sudan mentioned, I have worked with the abnormal transplant surgeons for quite some time, 15 years to be exact. And uh, yes, it is, it is true. We um, had in mind to perform an abdominal wall transplantation for quite some time. We practiced this um, procedure in the um, fresh tissue lab. So we have a lab in which we can actually train ourselves to perform these procedures. We also invited a specialist from Great Britain to um, assist us in the preparations who was here last year. And um, well, um, my my, my job, my assignment in this kind of scenario in Mr. Nauda's procedure was to perform an abdominal wall transplantation at the same time as Dr. Sudan and her team performed the small bowel transplantation. So we are talking about two procedures at the same time, which requires a major infrastructure, a team of 25 or more people working in the operating room, and um, really everything has to come together. Um, what we also did by in, in our preparation, we found a new and uh, innovative way to reconnect the blood supply to the abdominal wall by creating a what is called a vascular loop um, at the thigh level. So we are staying completely out of, um, um, out of the, the space of the transplant surgeons by performing our um, revascularization, meaning restoring the blood supply to the graft. So with this kind of technique, we can actually work at the same time doing both transplantation procedures without interfering with each other. And that is the new thing, that's the message um, that I would like to, to give you. And um, we also strongly believe that this type of, uh, this modification of this abdominal wall transplantation will open the door to many more patients in in the same scenario, like Dr. Uh, like uh, Mr. Nada, needing an organ transplant and having major problems with the abdominal wall, so surgeons may not be able to perform the organ transplant without proper closing of the abdominal wall. So, um, needless to say, this is this is a great achievement. We are very happy that we were able to to do this. I'm I'm excited about Mr. Nada's uh, recovery. Um, the fact that he is able to eat, the fact that he's um, able to leave the hospital soon, as, as uh, Dr. Sudan told me earlier. And we are really, really looking forward to, to all the things that can happen in the future. We open the door to many, many more patients. Uh, and this is really something we want to we wanna tell everybody. It's not about us. It's about the innovation that we provided that hopefully can help many more patients in the future. So, so again, thank you for joining us this morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, and um, I'm, I'm very excited for, for, all the, for all the progress with uh, Mr. Nada's recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'd also like to invite uh, Danielle Niedefeld from the Carolina Donor Services, which is our local organ procurement organization through UNOS, to say a few words as well. Thank you. Good morning. It's an honor to be here today. It's an honor to collaborate with an innovative team like Duke on this kind of research and innovation. I'd like to talk to you a little bit about the donor and the donor process. When these gifts happen, it takes an innovative team like Duke and it also takes a very amazing clinical specialists in the local organ procurement organization. In this case, it was Carolina Donor Services. I'm very proud to be the CEO of that team. But most importantly, the gifts do not happen without the selflessness of a donor and the donor's family. So I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about Marcus and about his amazing family. So Carolina Donor Services is very proud to partner with Duke Health and other research institutions to provide these gifts to save and enhance lives through organ and tissue donation. These gifts are very special and unique in that the next of kin or the um, family authorizes these gifts. They do not um, exist in the North Carolina donor registry. So it's a very special circumstance with Marcus's family 
um, his parents identified that Marcus was not going to survive his injury. And in that moment when they were, were dealing with such a tragedy, they actually stopped and asked the question about organ donation. Um, so we were able to start working with them. Marcus was a great candidate for organ donation. They very generously authorized organ tissue and eye donation. And then very early in our process, as we were doing um, other screening, we identified that Marcus was a great match for this abdominal wall transplant. So we had an additional conversation with the parents and asked them to consider this very special gift. And it was very automatic for them. They just wanted to help as many people as they could. Um, Marcus's donation was also extraordinary in that typically an organ donor were able to transplant three to four organs. And in Marcus's case, we transplanted eight organs with six different recipients. So it was truly extraordinary in many ways. He and his parents are heroes. Um, I know a lot of people in this room feel that way, and there are many other recipients and people in their lives that definitely feel that way. So um, with that, I would love to introduce Marcus's mom, Sherry. She's here with some of her other family members and see if she'd like to share um, Marcus was loving and he was caring and I know that he would be very pleased with what me and his father have chosen for him since he can no longer be here with us and we're just pleased to be able to extend his life through the other people and help give their families the chance to be able to spend more time with their loved ones and so on. I also want to give our recipient, Mr. Jonathan Nada, an opportunity if he'd like to say a few words, um, and then we'll open it up for questions after that. Good morning, everybody. Dr. Sudan, Dr. Vidra, Dr. Sandalis, and Dr. Ehrman. Um, I'm just blessed to be here. I thank the Lord above, you know, for everything, and for Miss Scales and her and her family. It's, it's truly a blessing to be here. Um, I'm just overwhelmed with a lot of happiness here uh, with the team that, you know, placed their healing hands on me. And um, not only did they change my life, they changed my family life and uh, other, other people that can possibly be in my same situation in life. So I'm just very thankful and blessed to be here and for everybody's support. I really appreciate everybody. Thank you. All right. Well, th I think that that's the end of our prepared remarks. And um, while I, I would like to open it up to allow um, different folks to ask questions, um, you may ask them of anyone. I would ask Linda to please come up uh, to the table as well. You may have some specific questions about uh, the VCA component, and if you can come to the table to answer those questions as well. <coughs> Yes. I can't go up there. But Mr. Nada, can you tell us your story uh, behind the transplant, please? Um, yeah, okay. Um, this, I started having, uh, I guess, stomach problems uh, when I was about six years old. I all started with my appendix. And then um, as I got older, I had numerous surgeries uh, for intestinal blockage. Uh, scar tissue built up, and I just had numerous stomach problems. And I guess this in 2014, uh, when all this really happened, um, all I, you know, it's, uh, I'm sorry, excuse me, is this, um, it's all started down in uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina, ended up in a the hospital there. And um, I guess I ended up being transferred here to Duke. And um, Dr. Sudan's team was here waiting on me. And um, they was able to help me out, I guess. What's the, uh, what's the issue with your stomach? 
Okay, I came over with had an intestinal blockage again. Um, I was in the, I was a drill sergeant leader in the army and I just kept throwing up one morning and I was just feeling very sick, very ill. Took myself to the emergency room and the last thing I remember was going through the operating room September 24th, 2014 and waking up here at Duke October 5th. So throughout those 10 days, a, a lot you know, has gone on with, with my family and um, I woke up with Dr. Sedan and they explained you know, everything that, that has happened and what, um, what they're able to do. Uh, I guess we tried uh, different, different procedures. I think what, 21, 21 surgeries about, about 21 surgeries. And I think the uh, transplant was like the last, the last resort. Uh, I think it was just uh, from past, past uh, stomach problems, appendix. My appendix had ruptured when I was six years old. Uh, when I was, I think about 11 years old, that's when I had intestinal blockage. And I was actually here at Duke when, uh, when that happened. It started, I was in a Womack Army Hospital when they had the intestinal blockage. They cut, I guess, the, the piece that was blocked and put me back together. But I'm still having complications. They had transferred, transferred me here to Duke and um, received my care and they took care of me. And I was here for about four, four or five months. And then it happened again in uh, 2010 at uh, Fort Jackson, South Carolina. Uh, scar tissue had built up on that part that I had the intestinal blockage. Uh, from what I know, he, Dr. Um, what was his name? I forgot his name, but uh, I'm sorry. He went in, cleared that uh, scar tissue out, and I was good to go. And then this popped up again in 2014. Uh, well, Fayetteville, Fayetteville was my hometown, so that's where I spent most of my life. My dad was in the military. He retired there in Fort Bragg. Um, what, what else was it? How did it, there was a time where you couldn't eat, or, I mean, how did you, how did you keep going day to day, having, like, each of, these like, a series of medical problems and surgeries? And uh, well, I was... Eating, eating normal, uh, but when I, when I start feeling like, when I know something's really wrong, um, I just feel like dehydrated, uh, couldn't keep down anything. I was always throwing up like every 30, 30 minutes. Um, and I was trying to be hardcore, I guess. I didn't want to go to the hospital, I'm thinking, because I felt a little better after I threw up, but it just, I couldn't keep anything down. So, check myself in the hospital. Any, any other questions? I'll ask again. Sure. <laughs> um, can you tell me about? Can you tell me um, a little bit more about Marcus and his life? And um, um, you said it was an injury that caused him to pass away, and, and you knew this, um, how this was, was going to happen, and, and why you wanted to donate so, so many organs. And um, I guess what were those? And if you know that it's already gone to six other people. Um, Marcus was a very loving and caring person. Um, so when it came down to make the choice to donate his organs, um, me as his mother, I felt like, you know, it would be something that he would have wanted done. Um, we donated his heart, his liver, his pancreas, um, his kidneys, his abdominal wall, his intestines, and his lungs, <clears throat> which all went to, um, recipients right away. Um, 
when we were approached about the abdominal wall, I felt that, you know, if this person who was receiving my son's intestines needed his wall to keep them protected and to help, I had no problem doing it. I have a question for maybe one of the doctors. Can you explain exactly what an abdominal, abdominal uh, I can't pronounce the word. Abdominal. Can you, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Can you explain what that is um, for like the people who are not in the medical community? What all did it involve? What all does it do? Sure. Um, yeah, when you, if you look down at your stomach, that's your, that's your abdominal wall. So it consists of skin, but it consists of muscles. Uh, it's the entire thickness of your, your tummy, so to speak. And under the tummy are your organs, right? So the abdominal wall um, protects your organs um, and is essential to, um, to anything we do in transplant surgery or Dr. Sudan's team is doing. So once we place an organ in the abdominal cavity, we also have to be, we have to be able to close the abdominal wall, the muscles and skin. And uh, you saw the the pictures um, there, so the, Mr. Nauda's abdominal wall was just not sufficient to be closed over a small bowel transplant. Um, and the abdominal wall also contains the blood vessels to the muscles, to the skin. So we cannot just take an abdominal wall and place it on a uh, recipient. We have to restore blood flow similar to a kidney or to a small bowel or to any other organ. We cannot just take that organ and place it somewhere. We have to restore blood supply. So an abdominal wall is basically an organ, but it's not an organ. It's skin, muscle, fascia, and all the components of the tummy with its maintained blood supply. Does that make sense? Yes, it does. So this is the wall that, you, that was transplanted. Skin, muscle, everything, including the belly button. And that was very important for Mr. Nauda. <laughs> and Ms. Donata, um, as I was telling people the story that I'm doing today, I guess there's a certain gross factor with this. How, how, how do you stomach, I guess, no pun intended, but how did you stomach the transplant or just the news that you're getting another person's abdomen wall? Uh, it's, it's, it's a blessing. You know, like I said, this was one of the options that, uh, Dr. Sudan and the team, you know, came came forward with me with. Uh, it's uh, it's just mind blowing to me, you know. I would have never thought this was possible. Uh, I've just been truly blessed with, you know, the doctors that you see, you know, up here. You know, I know Duke is all about Duke basketball, you know, but this this is I'd rather be on this starting starting team right here any day, you know. Dr. Sudan, he's gonna be the Zion Williams of, of the team, and Dr. Urban be the, the R.J. Barrett. You know, <laughs> I'll, I'll start the point guard. You know, I'll do that since I'm the small one. And uh, you know, Dr. Sandalis and, and Dr. Ravidra, you know, will be the ones throwing up the, the highlights for everybody. I'm just blessed to be, you know, under their care. You know, this this is what I believe this is the team that represents Duke. You know. As a whole, this is this is just mind blowing. This is amazing to me. Um, it still hasn't really sunk in, sunk in with me yet. I just know that, you know, I'm now I'm part of another family, you know, with Scales family. You know, I just uh, just truly blessed, and uh, you know, I hope to to uh, take Marcus's uh, gifts and. Uh, just be, you know, be part of that innovative uh, and research um, to help other lives and to help, uh, you know, anybody else that was in, in my situation, you know. So if I can, you know, throw an advertisement out, you know, this is, this is the place to be. You know, if anybody's in my, my situation or somewhat my situation, you know, come, come to Duke. This is the team that, to, that you'd rather be with. But did anything make you squeamish about it? Just the fact that uh, this is... No, not really. I'm just okay. glad to have a belly button back. <laughs> you know, I never had, I think, uh, 2000... No, I say... No, before. I haven't had a belly button since the second surgery, so 2000... 
No, I, was, I believe I was in sixth grade at that time. Sixth grade when I had the first intestinal blockage. So I haven't had a belly button since then. So looking down on it, I'm, it's, it's just a blessing. You know, I get to pick at something when I'm bored. <laughs> but it's just truly a blessing to be here. And I can't, I can't thank the team. I can't thank, you know, Mrs. Scales and her family, you know, much. But just a big thank you. And just God bless everybody here. Can you tell us about this, um, what was going on that 14 hours and what the risk was involved? And so the, the donations were both the intestines and the abdominal wall, right? Does that make it easier having that? I mean, would it even be possible to have that from two separate donors? And um, not, not very easily. It may be possible, but not easy. So his intestinal transplant, um, took quite a long time to perform because of all of the prior surgeries he had and the extensive scar tissue. It actually took quite a while before we were able to um, remove the uh, very small amount of rem remaining small bowel that he had and identify the vessels to um, hook the new graft to. So a lot of that time was done in preparation for the transplant. And while we were working in the abdominal cavity, getting his aorta and vena cava prepared, the blood vessels prepared, um, Dr. Erdman started working in the groins to prepare the blood vessels where we could put the abdominal wall graft. And um, then we brought the organs from, Dr. Ravindra uh, brought the organs from the donor hospital and prepared them on the back table. And then he helped me sew the intestine in and Dr. Erdman and his plastic surgery team uh, sewed the, uh, the abdominal wall in. Um, and it was really quite remarkable. Um, it was incredible to see his abdominal wall from the beginning to the end. Um, you know, you can see pictures here. I don't know if it quite does it justice, but uh, he really had lived through quite a lot of, of pain and suffering, um, not to mention not being able to eat. And about a year ago, he had a very significant complication from an infection from his IV nutrition. Um, and Jonathan nearly died at that time, and we knew at that point there was some urgency with it, um, which we needed to move to save his life. And so it was remarkable when this uh, all came together. Yeah, again, um, so if you say like, oh, this took 14 hours, it's not only the transplant process itself, it's also the preparation for the actual transplant. So um, we are not sitting there waiting for... Dr. Ravindya to come in and then we get started. We actually get started at the time when we get the call from the outside that there is um, a gift available uh, and, and that is very important. So it's the entire procedure. And I want to make this very clear again. So I, I was leading the effort on the abdominal wall transplant, but I would never, never be able to do this by myself. So I have a very, very uh, valuable partners, um, trainees, uh, who helped me during this process. And um, it's really, it is um, 14 hours of, of work, but everybody has to take a break in between. So it's, it's a constant team effort. And um, uh, again, not only by myself, uh, I was the leader in this kind of part of the procedure, but I had plenty of excellent, excellent help. Yeah, I wanted to give a little update, a brief description of, you know, one. The focus was obviously on not uh, getting this organ transplant, but a lot of events happened at the donor hospital, which uh, CDS, uh, you know, <coughs> Daniel, uh, Ms. Needfeld was mentioning, and uh, it, it truly takes a village for transplant to happen. Transplant is truly teamwork, and not as summed it up saying in basketball analogy, but it's really, there's one, sp one uh, uh, specialty in medicine, but really involves teamwork is, uh, transplantation. So at the donor hospital, we had five different teams flying in, or I wouldn't say flying in, but coming from different hospitals, some of them driving, some of them flying from different, uh, and all of them played in the same sandbox, so to speak. And everybody was trying to get the organs for their own very sick recipients. And uh, all, all of this was possible because of Marcus and uh, his mo mother's willingness to donate. And uh, the liver was actually split into two, two parts so that it could be used in two different individuals, one of which was used at our center. 
yeah, the abdominal, uh, the bowel and the pancreas had to be separated. So that itself was a separate exercise. Normally we take the pancreas with the bowel as one to get extra length of vessels. But in this case, we were able to isolate and separate them, two of them, so that they could be used in two different individuals. And, <clears throat> and uh, uh, Marcus, we had to make sure that we got adequate blood vessels. And this all took nearly about five to six hours of work at the donor hospital, which was going on simultaneously with uh, Dr. Sudan and Dr. Erdman already starting here. So there was a close co cooperation. And uh, <clears throat> I would really like to thank the team at CDS there were at least five of the coordinators who were present at that occasion who made it all possible. There was constant communication, and two of my, our own team members, Dr. Shah and Stuart Henry, who were part of our procurement team who were present at that donor hospital to bring it back. And once we brought it back, the, the rest of the events went as Dr. Sudan described. And maybe it's important for you to also know that um, an organ transplant uh, or an abdominal wall uh, cannot sit uh, somewhere for many, many hours. So there's a, there's a, there's a time limit uh, until that graft would potentially not do so well. So that's why we are under uh, tremendous pressure in terms of timing. And um, if we then have to do two transplantations in one patient at the same time, there could potentially, uh, uh, you know, be an interference in terms of time and space. Um, um, and, and we were, uh, I, I think, uh, elegantly getting around this by being able to, to do both <coughs> re, re, uh, revascularizations, meaning uh, restoring the blood flow to the organ and the abdominal wall at the same time. And I, I don't think that has been ever described in the way that we did it. Been, is that why there's only been about 20 of these in the past 20 years? Um, that's, that's probably one of the reasons. Um, and uh, Dr. Sudan um, mentioned earlier, you really have to have a, um, a team of specialists, not only specialists in plastic surgery, but also a specialist in a small bowel transplant, uh, also a special in, specialist in, in um, uh, you know, getting the gift from the outside, it's uh, nursing, uh, specialized nursing care, specialized intensive care, specialized in uh, anesthesiologists, uh, people like uh, Danielle who, who lead the effort um, of getting the gifts from the family. So it's, it's, it's really, um, it takes so much infrastructure and effort. That's probably one of the reasons that only 20 have been done over the 20 years. And also we need to have a good indication. We need to have a patient um, who is in this um, in this kind of scenario like Mr. Nauda, but what we are believing in that there are probably plenty of patients at outside institutions who do, don't even know about what we can do and their physicians might not even uh, be able uh, to, to get this information. This is why we're sitting here today, not, not because of us, but to get the message out to other patients and um, really to, um, to emphasize um, the donor family and, and Mr. Nauda. How is this funded? Oh, that's a very good question. <laughs> um, we do have a finance team that works with us and uh, secured um, insurance coverage for the combined transplant. Um, we do that routinely with any solid organ transplant as our finance team will work with the patients and then look at their insurance and find out what will be covered and um, they did their work beforehand, uh, part of the big team that is needed for transplantation. Do you have, like, or do you still have to pay for this? Did insurance cover everything um, and recovery and everything else that you're dealing with after this? Uh, yes, ma'am. Uh, I believe my, I'm under track here for life for the, for the Army. And um, also I have had the Medicare part, A and B, I guess that's uh, taking care of it. But I believe there's still some out-of-pocket costs and uh, there's, uh, I enrolled in that, the Help Hope Live uh, organization, a charity, uh, to also help.
If there are no other questions, um, I think we can go ahead and wrap up. But thank you all very much for coming and uh, listening to the stories of Mr. Nada and, and uh, Marcus. And I really appreciate your being here.